All right, gang, welcome to this episode of the Dealer Playbook Podcast. I am so excited about getting to sit down with Weldon Long. He's a best-selling author, entrepreneur, mindset phenomenon. Can I say phenomenon? He's a mindset expert. And, you know, one of the reasons I wanted to have him on the show today is because, I mean, you know me, gang, I'm all about that mindset. There are some people on this planet that are living in tropical, sunny, blue skies, yet it's raining in their world. And I really just believe in the power of shifting the lens by which you see the world. So, so excited to have him. Weldon, thanks so much for joining me on the Dealer Playbook Podcast. It's my pleasure. I'm very excited to be here. Thanks for having me. How do you get into, like, when is that moment in your history where you're like, oh, mindset, that's that's the thing that I'm going to focus on? Yeah, in my case, it's a very specific day. It was June 10th of 1996. And I remember it very specifically because it's a day my father died. And uh, when my father died, I was in federal prison. I had uh, previously done about six and a half years in the state of Colorado, in and out of prison as a young person. I was a high school dropout, just a real knucklehead. So I did about six years in the state system. I got out and uh, was back in federal prison on federal money laundering charges um, surrounding some shady telemarketing I was involved in. I was 32 years old and I was a first class punk and a garden variety loser. And I was in prison at 32 years old. And on June 10th of 1996, my father died. And when my father died, the reality of my life hit me, the reality of what I had done to myself, to society, to my family. And uh, I was very desperate to find some answers. And so my master plan was to start reading and learn what really successful people did and do that. And lo and behold, I found out that uh, more than anything, as you've just kind of uh, outlined, uh, it's the mindset, right? Having the right mindset, uh, the right set of values and plans are really important, but the right mindset, what I call a prosperity mindset, a mindset to thrive in the face of adversity uh, is, uh, was, was the beginning of uh, some big changes for me in my life. And that's where it all started. It, it reminds me of, um, you know, back when I was a kid, I used to love reading these books there. There were choose your own adventure books. You know, you would read as the hero of the story and periodically would be faced with a decision. And and it would say, you know, you've encountered a sleeping dragon. Do you want to impress <laughs> the heroine of the story and go in and slay it? Or do you want to take the safe way around? If you want to slay mm-hmm. it, go to page 63. If you want to be safe, turn to page 24. I'm this is when I realized I'm horrible at making life decisions and my mindset was vain. I was like, dude, I gotta, I gotta go and impress the beautiful blonde hero here, heroine of the story. Right. And I always got killed by the monster on page 63. <laughs> always inevitably. I, I, I got to a point where I thought that the stories were fixed. I'm like, this is fi- no, come on. No. In fact, you can make good life decisions and you can change the way that you see the world. What's, yep. So, so bring me into this moment. So you, you found out your father's passed away. This is a life altering, mindset changing experience. What does that do? What was the process to truly seeing things the way that you see them now? Yeah. So after my father died, uh, at the time I had a three-year-old son that I had fathered when I was out on parole. So when my dad died, I kind of saw myself and this is literally within the hours after he died, I'm in my cell and I'm kind of picturing myself between my father and my son. And uh, and again, understanding the the gravity of the the hurt and the just the destruction I had caused in my life and those around me, and I made this decision I was going to be a a man that my father could have been proud of, and I was going to be the father my son deserved. I had seven years left to go in in federal prison. I had just started the seven year term, and uh, so as I made this decision, I'm going to you know figure this thing out. I started reading. And uh, the very first book I picked up that same day, I went to, uh, there was a broom closet down at the end of the cell house. And I walked down there and there's a big box that cops would throw the books in, donate some books. And it was kind of our library and then housing unit. And I'm rifling through that book and I come across a a copy of of the classic, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Not knowing that years later, Dr. Covey would become a friend of mine. He endorsed my books. (laughs) We got to work together. But at this point, I was 32 years old, three-time loser in the penitentiary. And I start reading that book. And one of the things that Dr. Covey says in the introduction of that book is that you have the ability, the option to live out of your imagination rather than your past. And that was Mm. significant news for me because my past was poverty and violence and struggle, incarceration, all these different things. And but I had a very vivid imagination. I could I could imagine wonderful things. And so I started realizing that, wow, maybe if I painted a different picture mentally, 
that maybe I could move in that direction. And I remember coming across a quote from, uh, from Nietzsche and Nietzsche said that we attract that which we fear. And when I first read that, I thought it was nonsense. Like, why would I attract things I fear, things I don't want in my life? So I kind of dismissed it the first time I came across it. A couple of months later in the summer of 96, I was uh, flipping through the pages of the Bible, came across a scripture in Job where Job says, Father, that which I have feared has come upon me. And I'm like, that's kind of crazy because Nietzsche was an atheist. <laughs> Job was a you know godly man, God-free man, separated by right. a couple of thousand years, different philosophies, <laughs> right. saying the exact same thing. And then it happened a third time. I started reading Covey talks. Uh, Stephen Covey was a huge fan of, uh, of Victor Frankel, who wrote Man's Search for Meaning. So I ordered a copy uh, in the prison system. We had interlibrary loans. You could order books from other libraries to borrow and right. order a copy of Man's Search for Meaning. And there's a chapter in that book where the first four wor words are fear may come true. And like I'm getting inundated with this concept. And so I started thinking, like, what do I fear the most? So I, I got a sheet of paper out and I wrote down what I feared the most. It was living and dying in prison, never being a father of my son, being a broke, homeless loser the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. And I looked around. I'm like, wow, that looks an awful lot like my life. <laughs> All the <laughs> chaos was getting out of here. I was attracting everything I feared. And right. that's when it hit me, uh, that Emerson quote, you know, we become what we think about all day long. So I, I right. sat down at that little metal desk in my cell. I wrote out in a sheet of paper what a perfect life for me would look like. Beautiful home, beautiful family, you know, the whole life. Being a man of honor, character, being the right kind of father. I'd visualize being that person, having that life. I wrote it all out. And I took toothpaste and put it in the back of that piece of paper and stuck it to the wall on my cell. And I spent the next seven years every day reading and meditating on that list. Now, what I didn't know back in those days was the neurology behind what was going on, that I was literally reconstructing my neural pathways, my habitual thoughts. Right. And over time, I began to have these crazy habitual thoughts, like I'm going to be successful. I'm going to be happy. I'm going to be, you know, all these things. I'm going to put this life behind me. And uh, by the time I walked out seven years later, of course, a lot of things happened in those seven years. Uh, I educated myself. I, I studied business. I studied law. I studied philosophy. I studied history. I learned all the stuff I should have learned years ago. And I walked out of the penitentiary in January of 2003 and uh, built this crazy life. And it didn't even take very long. It was just a few years. But it was all about that mindset that I had defined myself and seen myself so many years as a ninth grade high school dropout loser, then a convicted felon loser. And I just I started believing all this stuff about myself. And right. when I started seeing myself differently, it's like, guess what? Different thoughts produce different emotions, different emotions, different behaviors, <laughs> different behaviors, different results, right? It's not, it's not rocket science. It is kind of neuroscience, brain science, but it's not rocket science. And, uh, and that's the process the last 20 years I've been reading and writing about and speaking about and building companies along the way. And just, uh, just, I mean, having a great time. It's just my life today is just mind boggling in terms of the things I get to enjoy with my family and my friends and the lifestyle. It's just, it's crazy. I have so many questions. I'm trying to organize where I want to go next. Um, I love everything about this. Um, I think about the, the concept of the refiner's fire and how there's a, you brought up, what, what I, I call them eternal truths because they've just that it truth is truth. Right. And you're bringing up different people separated by thousands of years who are saying the same truth. And that same truth exists today, thousands of years later. Uh, and that's why I call it kind of the eternal truth. It's just always existed. Um, and I think about I was just at a conference in Vegas um, and every quote unquote successful multi-billionaire that came to the stage all expressed similar things. And it was this concept of having to pass through moments of extreme adversity to have that paradigm shift. And I refer to it as the refiner's fire or for our comic book geeks. It's in Superman, I think three, when he lands in this coal mine and picks up a chunk of coal and starts blasting, pressuring it in his hands and blasting it with his laser rays and the diamonds appear. Uh, obviously very uh, sensationalized how to create diamonds out of coal. But but I think of you were in the pre like you were in a pressure cooker. And because of that, do you believe that that's what because you said the success didn't take very long, just a matter of a few years. Do you think it's because the refiner's fire accelerated your ability to execute? 
Absolutely. A hundred percent that it was the going through that adversity and the lessons I learned to that adversity uh, that that made me stronger. And I, I kind of refer to it as a slingshot effect. I feel like that a lot of successful people, I don't know about all, but a lot of successful people have had some tragedy in their past, like you mentioned about these guys you saw in Vegas. And it's almost like the further back, the further down that slingshot goes when it's finally released, the momentum carries it, you know, significantly uh, disproportionately, you know, farther. And I think there is, uh, and I think for most people, like 90% of what I've learned, maybe a hundred percent of what I've learned, I learned through my failures. Like when things work out, a business thing works out or something, like at the time I'm like, wow, that's, I don't know how that happened. It's good. <laughs> but when something fails and you're forced to, <laughs> to reconcile that to me, that's when I do my best learning. Right. And so right. I totally feel that the the things I went through, you know, in, in that book, uh, Man's Search for Meaning, Victor Frankl talks about finding meaning and purpose in your suffering. And when you can do that, mm-hmm. that's when you can enjoy life. And it's interesting. So I had done six and a half years before my dad died on two different trips to state prison and they were miserable. Like I was a miserable human being. I was caught up in all of it. And then after I kind of had these realizations and I, I read Man's Search for Meaning and I, I, I hit the realization one day like, wow this suffering one day is going to have a purpose. It's going to have some meaning. And then all of a sudden it wasn't meaningless, painful suffering. It was just part of the process. Mm. And it got easier for me. Like the right. last six years I did, like it just, I mean, it was long and it was lonely and it was bored, but man, I was, I was so productive. I was, I, I was writing, I was studying, I was working out and just all the stuff you do in prison. And like, I came out and I felt like I was, uh, uh, just a brand new person. I remember that, that, that old, I think it was Socrates that said an unexamined life is not worth living. And I realized that I, I was now an examined life. Like I examined my life, every aspect of my life. I thought about it. I, I say now I learned to think about what I think about before I think about it. You know, <laughs> I, I learned to get in that mindset and think about the things I'm going to think about before it just happens automatically 30,000 times a day, which is right. what neuroscientists estimate. We make 30,000 small decisions a day. Where are those decisions coming from? Right. I mean, and, and, and I realized it's coming from my head. What, what's in there? What I call the box. What's in the box? Right. And uh, what I realized, a lot of stuff in my box as I began to study and research the kind of behavior and the psychology behind it. My box was full of stuff that other people would put in there. My parents, society, right. a lot of it myself. And so I was reaching in and pulling out out of my box decisions that were put in there by other people. Like I realized, well, I have the ability to fill my box up. And so I started replacing the contents. And the basic lesson is that every time we make a decision, again, neuroscientists say 30,000 times a day, every time I reach in that box, I want to make sure what I pull out is something I put in there this morning, not something somebody else put in there 40 years ago. And that's a big mm. difference in terms of the decisions that I make. The result of better outcomes. How do you do that? I mean, I, I, you know, I think about in my twenties, I I dealt with about a decade of severe suicidal depression. Mm. Um, I I often recount when I speak to youth groups and things of that nature, I often recount that changing my mind was one of the most difficult things I've ever had to do in my life. I'm so grateful I went through it and I'm grateful for what's happened on the other side of it. But from your vantage point, for those that are struggling to, you know, see the good in their team or failing to see the opportunities and abundance that are ahead of them, especially as we move into, um, you know, call it an economic reset or however people are positioning this in the media. What are some things that those listening or watching can do on the daily to start changing their mind? It's a great question. Uh, And it's the basis of my second book, which is called The Power of Consistency, really takes a deep dive into this. But the essence of it is that uh, when when you have a thought, we have any thought, good, bad, happy or sad, it sends an impulse across your brain to a part of your brain called the hypothalamus. When the hypothalamus receives the impulse from that electromagnetic energy in your brain, it begins to secrete a chemical that triggers the corresponding emotion. So, the emotions are not random. They're not just happening in a vacuum. They are a chemical reaction to the thought. So in other words, if I get frightened or I get angry, my hypothalamus starts producing epinephrine and adrenaline and I feel angry mm. uh, or scared. If right. I, if my wife walks in a room or my kid and I have loving, warm thoughts, uh, the hypothalamus starts producing uh, endorphins, right? And I feel warm and loving. So your emotions don't happen in a vacuum. They are a chemical reaction to the thought. 
And then once you have a thought, of course, you drive some behavior and those behaviors drive results. And what I, what I realized is that even though my behaviors and my emotions were a reflection of my thoughts, what I learned is that those emotions and those behaviors are a reflection of the thought, even if the thought is inaccurate, even if it's wrong. Like you can believe something that's not real and produce very real emotions, very real behaviors and very real results. Wow. And the example I use is that suppose you're walking out of the theater one night, you're with Mm -hmm. your spouse and a couple of kids and some guy comes running towards you. He's screaming. He's covered in blood. He's got a knife in his hand and he's running towards you and your family. Right. Within a second, nanosecond, your brain saying danger, danger, danger. Within right. another nanosecond, your hypothalamus is producing adrenaline and epinephrine. And now you have to have some behavior, right? Fight or flight. What am I going to do? Well, you decide very quickly you can't run because you got little kids with you. You cannot run the guy. So you got to fight him. So you kind of charge towards him to get him away from your family. You engage with the guy. You catch him in the jaw. You drop him like a sack of potatoes. What's the result? You protected your family. Perfect, right? But then the police get there and the guy regains consciousness and you realize your thought was wrong. It was inaccurate. Turns out the guy was no threat to you whatsoever. It was all fake. It was a teenage kid with fake blood and a fake knife running across the parking lot to meet some friends for a Halloween party. Yeah. Even though the thought turned out to be wrong, how real were the emotions you felt? How right. real was the hitting him, the behavior? How real right. was his broken jaw? It's all real. Real. And you realize that this happens in our life every single day. We think false things about money, about relationships, about sales, about business, about all these different things. And even though they're bull, they drive very real emotions, behaviors, and results. I, you, I know you work with a lot of, of, of car people in the automotive industry, right? Take a group of car sales guys, put them in a room and say, hey, I'm going to give you a word and I want you to tell me the first word that comes to your mind and then tell them salesman. And I guarantee you, I've been doing this for 20 years and hundreds of thousands of people and two thirds of the people (laughs) that are in sales will have a negative word come to mind. Pushy, snake oil, lazy. Right. How in the hell are you going to get good at sales if fundamentally in your box you think sales are pushy, high pressure, sleazy, snake oil, whatever? You're never going to be the best at it. So you have to be careful that your thoughts have to be consistent and in alignment with what you're trying to accomplish. Otherwise, you're going to be driving the wrong emotions, the wrong behaviors, the wrong results. Right. That's why I say you got to think about what you think about because you're going to react to those thoughts emotionally and physiologically, even if they're not true. That's the scary part about life, you know, and, and I mean, and, and we got these ideas in our head. I'm 59 years old. You get those ideas in your head when you're six years old. So I got stuff been floating around there for over 50 years and right. some of it's BS, right. but it was driving my emotions and my behaviors. I, wow. I, I, it, you immediately with your scenario brought to mind a very real example that happened to me years ago, you know, before marriage, before moving out. I, I got caught in a snowstorm and I was driving home a, a drive that should have only taken 45 minutes, took four and a half hours and I'm angry and I get home and it's late. And I'm, as I'm walking up the stairs into, into our house, I'm thinking, why is this light on? And I go and look into our family room and there's my little sister with her boyfriend and they're not doing anything. Well, they're not doing, I don't know what they're <laughs> Teenager. He had his hand on her leg and I go, why are you here? Mm. You know? And the, uh, you got 10 minutes to get out of my house or I'm going to kill you. Cause I was already mad. I'm already, right. and I see him and I'm like, it's two 30 in the morning. I'm like, you get it. now. I don't remember saying I was going to kill him. I was, I just remember being <laughs> mad. <laughs> and I remember being, I'm the only brother. I got four sisters, dude, you got two choices, the hospital or the cemetery. Which one's it going to be? <laughs> the next day I go to work. I don't even, th- I don't think anything of it. Uh, my mom and my other sister connect with me. And they said, did you tell that boy you were going to kill him? I'm like, I don't know. Sounds feasible. They're like, <laughs> don't you know he was just diagnosed with leukemia? Mm, wow. And I, I went, like my mom looked at me, the, the, the distaste Mm. That her son, who she believed she had raised right, told someone with a terminal illness that he was going to kill him. And that stuck with me all these years. And but it but you're right. It was all of this emotion that I felt made 
my feelings seem very real, yep. not recognizing the impact that that was going to have on someone else who was actually experiencing something very well, real. And this is the craziest part. Imagine that same scenario. And let's say he didn't leave the house in 10 minutes and you got mad at him and you beat the hell out of him. Right. Right. And now you're in jail for assault or attempted murder. Right. On a fake thought on something that was wrong. You just misinterpreted the situation. And right. that's what happens to a lot of people. They take actions on that. And next thing you know, things are out of control and you realize, oh, that wasn't even the situation. Right. Crazy. How often could, do we do that with our teams, with our employees, yeah. with our oh, I'll give coworkers? You a perfect example. So uh, I've owned a half a dozen heating and air conditioning companies over the last 20 years. Uh, mm -hmm. We'll buy them or build them from scratch and sell them. And it's a great little business. And uh, I remember one time we had this service technician, great guy, but like two or three days a week, he was 15 to 20 minutes late every single week. And everybody was getting mad, right? The other technicians, his boss, the service manager, everybody's getting mad. And the, the, the service manager is telling me, I'm going to fire this guy. He just refuses to get in line. You know, other people like, how come he gets to come in late? It was creating all kind of chaos in the business. And I said, well, I mean, wh why is he late? He goes, I don't know. He just can't be here on time. I'm like, well, let's find out what's going on. <laughs> so right. we sat down with the guy. As it turns out, he hadn't told anybody, but he had moved to Colorado for his wife to go to graduate school. She had just graduated and he had just found out when she graduated, she was having an affair and she left him. And oh, so no. he was had the kids a few days a week and he was struggling getting them to school, getting to work on time. But he didn't want to tell anybody that the wife, because he was always praising her, he loved her so much. And all of a sudden she ran off with somebody else. He was so embarrassed. But right. when we found out what happened, we all pitched in. Hey, can we help you with the kids? Or my wife sure. will take them for you or something. Right. You pitch in. Stephen Covey tells this great story. It's kind of like the one you just told. He gets on this subway in New York City years ago, and this guy gets on the train with two or three kids, and these kids are running up and down the, the train. They're completely unruly, and just he's not even paying attention to them. And at one point, Cubby says, sir, you know, could you, like, can you control your kids? And the guy kind of snaps, too, and he goes, oh, I, I'm sorry. He goes, we just left the hospital. Their mother died, and they don't know how to act. I don't know how to act. And all of a sudden, he was like, wow, let me help you with your kids. So this is why we have to be so careful to subject our thoughts to analysis, because they can be wrong and proactive people, responsible people. That's why they stop and, and wait for all the facts, right? I was a person for years of my life. It's the reason I wound up in prison, fly off the handle. There was no time for any thought. And I've learned as I've gotten older and it's a healthier way, you got you to gotta wait till you get all the facts. You got to wait and figure things out because if you act too quickly and it could be the wrong interpretation, you can get yourself in a world of hurt. So you got to really make sure that, you know, it's funny because humans, we're the only uh, uh, species on this planet that have the ability to reason and to think about things, right? Mm -hmm. Animals, other animals act on instinct. So if you step on your dog's tail, the dog doesn't pause and say, hmm, I wonder if my owner meant that intentionally or if he's just <laughs> in a hurry and didn't and didn't understand he did it. The right. dog's not going to the dog's going to turn around and bite you. Right. instinctively right humans have the ability to stop and think i wonder if that was intentional i wonder like with with, with your sister is uh, am i thinking what's going on here is, is it accurate right and so you know there's an old saying that that the, the the man the woman who doesn't read is no better off than the man or the woman who who can't read right well the human being that doesn't pause and reflect and get all the facts is no better off than the animal who lives on instinct and doesn't have the ability to pause and reflect Right. So it's just it's powerful stuff. And, and I can you know, it's just I'm, I'm with you, man. The mindset stuff is so critical. You know, I just made a connection to listening to what you just said. I'm 40 now. This experience must have happened when I was. 22, 21. Well, of course, he was at my house. There was a snowstorm that took me four and a half hours to get home. Right. And his parent, he probably called his parents and they said, you got to hang out and wait till the roads get cleared. And they right. probably ran it past my parents. Like, why am I thinking my parents were such fools for letting this, right? This man sit in our Good house. Point. Good point. I can't believe it took me almost 20 years to just make that connection. Uh, well, DPB gang, you can unsubscribe now. I'm a piece of crap. <laughs> <Just> <laughs> Um, I thought I, I was thinking you were your sister's hero. You were going to protect her. I mean, never mind the guy you were beating up was perfectly innocent, but you know, you still protected your sister. <laughs> but you know, it, it has stuck with me, and it's something I think about often 
in an effort to shed what I call my natural carnivorous, you know, whatever fire, my fiery furnace is my lifelong pursuit to ensure that everyone I come in contact with sees the best in themselves. And, you know, it's one of the reasons I have been producing the show for 10 years and, and just this, this desire that we are greater than we give ourselves credit for. And so be great. As we move into this next period of economic uncertainty, I know there's a lot of talk about this in the automotive industry. In the spirit of seeing things as they really are, what advice or thoughts could you you share with car dealers as they navigate uncertainty to recognize the opportunities and the abundance, not the lack of? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I've got a buddy of mine that owns a Cadillac dealership, Range Rover and Jaguar and Infinity. And I just happened to run into him a few days ago. And I just said, How, how's it going? He goes, well, he goes, you know, we got we got 800 credit scores uh, getting, you know, 7.9 percent interest rates. And, we, you know, people are upset. We can't get inventory. Right. We have inventory right. problems, you know. And so it is a challenging time. But here, here's the thing that I've learned. At the end of the day, challenging times don't mean you can't be successful. It just means you have to work harder to be successful. You know, sometimes you can be when the economy is raging, you can show up and you make a bunch of money. But when the when the when when circumstances are are difficult, you can still make money. You just got to got to work harder. You might have to work twice as hard, but but I'm okay with that. I remember back in 2008, 2009. Right. We all remember that kind of great recession right in 2007. I had borrowed about $2 million to buy a couple of my competitors in the heating and air conditioning industry. In addition to borrowing a couple of million dollars, I assumed all the money they owed to suppliers, which Mm. was to the tune of another million dollars. Right. Right. And then 2008 happened and we got smacked like everybody else. Right. Once the housing market collapsed, everything else followed Uh, people, air conditioning and plumbing, those types of projects in their homes, uh, people tend to do those when they feel like they got a lot of equity in their home. They got that HELOC. They're feeling confident. And when right. that goes away, it's tough. Right. And uh, I, I remember getting with my team and I'm like, guys, we can't borrow our way out of this situation. We can't steal our way out. There's only one way. We're going to have to sell ourselves out of this situation. And we had to get better at selling. We had to get better at what we do. Listen, Covey used to talk about the circle of concern. Draw a big circle. Everything you're concerned with is in that circle. But inside that smirk circle is a smaller circle called the circle of influence. And that circle of influence is everything you're concerned about over which you actually have control, which is typically ourselves. We don't control the economy. We don't control interest rates. We don't com- control inflation. We don't control the supply chains, right? So the only thing we control is ourselves. So to me, when I have a situation like that, it's like, okay, the only thing that matters is what can I do to be successful in this environment, right? Uh, back in that 08, 09 period, by the way, many of our competitors folded up, shop went out of business, right. mm-hmm. and we we got we got through it, right? Now we had to work way harder. We had to work harder. We had to lean up our staff. We had to do more with less. But I'm okay with busting my ass twice as much if that's what it takes. Now, when things are great, right? I'll enjoy the easy times. But man, when things get tough, it's just a matter of saying, okay, I'm just going to work harder. I'm going to get better at sales. I'm going to get better at building relationships. I'm going to get better at investigating uh, my prospects problems. I'm going to get better at recommending solutions. I'm going to get better at closing. It's that simple. Just get better. Right. I mean, listen, I'm a firm believer that money doesn't necessarily go away. It just kind of shifts like somebody's got money out there. In 2008, 2009, when people were going to the foreclosure, guess what? There were real estate investors snagging them up. The money wasn't gone. It just shifted to other people. So you got to find out how you can capitalize on those opportunities, get better at communicating, better at diagnosing problems, better at closing, all those things. And you can still be successful. You have to focus on what you can control. The bottom line is, is that winners focus on the circle of influence. Whiners focus on the circle of concern. They complain, bellyache, bitch and moan about things over which they have no control. We don't control the, the macro economy. I love it. I love this conversation. I love this conversation. Thank you so much for sharing your time with uh, us today. How can those watching, listening, get in touch with you, get a copy of your book and and follow you? Yeah, uh, Amazon, just uh, go on Amazon, Weldon Long, or go to our website, WeldonLong.com. It's W-E-L-D-O-N, well done, long. And uh, all the books and stuff are on there, all the stuff we're doing, social media, all that stuff's out there. Very easy to find. 
Thanks so much for joining me on the Dealer Playbook Podcast. Thanks, brother. My pleasure. 